You're talking about one of my strategies. I fix stuff that I didn't even break. Yeah. How do you like that? How do you like that one? Yeah. Let's take a picture of it, fix it, take another picture of it, and say, I fixed that. And then they go, How much are you going to charge me for that? Don't worry about it. We, we took care of it. I feel like in our interactions, you have shared that you have a real interesting background in this industry. And you probably know as much as anybody I've talked to about the history of the industry. And I find that super fascinating. And so I would just kind of love to dive into the story of Ron. So that's that's what I have on my mind. Okay. Is that fair? Is that okay? No. You can I, leave out I, what I'll, it. I'll answer any questions. No, there's nothing, there's nothing to hide. I mean, I've been doing this for 40 years, man. All right. I mean, right. surface cleaners were invented under my watch. <laughs> you know what I mean? What is, soft wash what is, systems. Soft what wash does systems that mean invented. that surface cleaners were invented under your watch? Let's start there. It means that I, ba- it means that I beta tested them. One who of the, was the first? One of the very first yeah, ones. Who, who was the first? That's... Uh, the guy's name that was first was some guy in Oklahoma, but I don't remember his name. And then, uh, you know, I don't want to tell these proprietary things like that. This this stays out like somebody stole it. You know what I'm saying? But the company, let's just leave it nameless. The company yeah. that I beta tested it for, um, you know, I, was not the original. You know, they were not the original maker, but they were one of the biggest in the business. So they were able to come in and mass produce them and really, you know, put them out. Mm -hmm. 40 years ago, when you got started, hot water and cold water did not combine each other. That's right. They didn't exist. You had to have a hot water machine, which was steam and a pressure washer, which was only at the time, thousand PSI was tops and two gallons a minute. Really? Yes. Really? How was the industry different? back then like how was the world of pressure washing different 40 years there ago? there was no line item in anybody's budget to clean sidewalks it didn't exist we had to invent it and make it happen now is that just We're, because it sorry i was gonna say is that is that just because like i mean two two gallons a minute so you're taking like you know i'm doing a sidewalk taking you all day or like a, a store like a week a, to do a store a like, target a giant target shopping center took almost 10 days now it takes six hours mm-hmm. 10 days mm-hmm. yeah you literally we used a steam cleaner because we knew we couldn't damage the sidewalk so we used a sioux steam cleaner have you ever seen a sioux steam cleaner it, it, they're mounted on trailers and they're the size of a vehicle you know what I mean? That's how big this thing is, okay? And it puts out 300 psi, uh, 300 degree, 300 degree plus water. You know, I mean, that's what steam is, and um, you know, it would melt the bubble gum off the sidewalk. Now, was it a better way to take gum off the sidewalk? Probably a safer way, but it was very time consuming. Very, very time consuming. And then you had to go back and pressure wash the sidewalk. So you would remove the bubble gum first do a little bit of the detailing, then you'd come back and pressure wash the sidewalk and then do the detailing in, in that aspect. So it was a, it was a, it was kind of a, it, it, you always would have the guy out and with the steam cleaner out in front of the other guy with the pressure washer and the steam cleaner was much slower. So you always really had to give that guy a real big lag time. Cause you would always catch up to him with the pressure washer. And that's just, a, so that's, using how, a wand. that's how it was done. Yeah. Huh? How did, how did said, you said, get just, in? Oh, there was only a wand. There was yeah, only a one, yeah, no and for cleaner, year yeah. and for years, because when the service cleaner came about and it was out for about ten years, people would ineffectively train their technicians to the use of the wand, and the people mm-hmm. didn't know how to like like you'd get a technician go, "Hey man, um, my service cleaner's broke. I'm wrapping it up for the night." And we're like, "Wait a minute!" For the first fifteen years, we cleaned with nothing but a wand. So we would we when we trained somebody for six weeks, we didn't give them a service cleaner. We made them wand everything. Yes, took took longer, more time consuming, but we wanted them to understand how to use that tool because we ourselves even forgot, you know, that, oh my goodness, when the service cleaner breaks, doesn't mean the job's done. You know, 
you're going to go ahead and finish it with a wand. And it is a pain in the neck, and it's very labor-intensive. I'm sure you've done it, Ryan. I mean, come on. Yeah. No, I th- yeah. when my first job was uh, I had a three-and-a-half-gallon mint machine and no service cleaner. And I, would, yeah. I, I mean, it was all residential, so I did driveways. And, you've, and, but you've, finished, and you've finished driveways. Yeah. It takes an hour and a half with a wand, and it takes 12 minutes with a service cleaner. That, those yeah. are the real numbers I'm giving you right there. Those are the real yeah, numbers. I, I quoted based on – when I started, I quoted based on uh, car size. So I'd pull up a driveway. It's like, okay, this That's a good this way to base can, them on. I was like, 30 minutes for the size of a car. This driveway holds four cars. That's two hours. There we go. And that's Man, I how loved, I came I love using, I loved using geometry. There's so many guys try to make things so complicated. A parking garage. Ron, how do I bid this parking garage? It's giant. How many spaces does it have? There it is. Calculate mm-hmm. whatever you want to make times the amount of spaces. That's the – the number for the parking garage is not it's not it's not rocket science and in these shopping centers and homes everything's geometrically built you know you're in the construction business brad you know this tell me that a commercial shopping center the shell of that center is not identical to every other one am i wrong yeah of course they are yeah they're they're 120 feet deep or 90 feet deep depending on its big box or it's the retail section now i'm not even in the building business but i know these things because why we've measured so many of them we don't need to measure them anymore. We know a grocery store on average is 4,500 square feet across the front of the sidewalk. It's what it is because there's construction standards. And I don't want to. I don't want to break y'all from the technical side of this conversation. Oh, I love but... it. I mean, you know, but, but 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 it's always good. But it's always good to get yeah. technical stuff in there and pricing because here's the reality of it. When these guys don't understand, like I've been doing this for 40 years. They don't understand that everything is based off of GLA and GLS in a commercial world. That's all it is. There's no other number. You, you being in the construction business know that per, per, per meal square footage requires X amount of landscape, X amount of air conditioning units, X amount of this, X amount of that. It's all a mathematical equation, and it's all science. And that's why an air conditioning company go, we have a 50,000 square foot air conditioned building. The guy doesn't have to count the units. He knows. He knows how many tons are on that roof. Now, some tolerances could be a little bit more or a little bit less, but we all know in the bidding process, no one's perfect, right? It's not a perfect. Mm-hmm. It's not a perfect world. Yeah. Hey, how did you Brad, get, how did you get how, into this how, business, Ron? How did I get into this business? Yeah. So, <laughs> so I was. I've told this story many times. Um, it was kind of. It was kind of. It was kind of funny thing. So go, I, w- I was watching sprinklers, automatic sprinklers, go on and off in college. And I made friends with a guy named Bobby Latito. And he was a dispatcher. We would have to call in to the dispatcher on campus. We'd have to go, hey, Bobby, we watched Section 9 come on and come off. You know, mark it in the logbook, you know. And I got to be friends with this guy. And... uh we did a lot of crazy things on campus. Leave all that off of, you know, because we had the keys to everything. But, <laughs> but one day he calls me up. He says, one nine. That was my jersey number. So he would call me one nine. He goes, one nine. And that was the radio. I got, that's the call number that they gave me on the radio. And I was like, Bobby's calling me in the middle of the freaking day. You know, it was like a Saturday afternoon or something like that. You know, I was like, I didn't even, th- I didn't even know he's in. I said, what's up, Bobby? He says, hey, he says, go over to, go over to this door. He says, uh, 5782, he says, it, you're, it's going to be difficult to find, but it's a janitor's closet. I said, a janitor's closet? I said, okay. And uh, I said, what, what are we doing, man? He says, just, just shut up. Go over there. I'll tell you what you're going to do when you get there. I get there. I find the key. First thing I do is open the door up, and it says, if you touch any of my blanking sh- stuff, I'll kill you. And it's signed, Mo. Okay. And I know who Mo is. He's like this six eight janitor, right? Yeah. It's this big, huge guy. You know what I mean? And uh, I go, Bobby, what do you got me doing here, man? He says, the first thing I open up, I see the thing. It says, don't touch my stuff. I'm going to kill you. And he goes, just don't worry about it, man. He says, there's a yellow bucket in there. There's a couple of poles and there's a mop and a squeegee. He goes, grab that and meet me over at the front of the student union. And I go, okay, Bobby. But I said, you know, if this guy, if this guy gets upset, I say, he goes, don't worry about it. I've talked to him. He knows what's going on. Just make sure you close that door back up so nobody else messes with his stuff. Boom, lock the door, 
me and more student union, we jump in the we go we jump in the golf cart, which we're not supposed to go off campus with the golf carts, right? You're never supposed to. But I could tell you this story about taking two vans to another campus one time for a party, but with everybody in the vans loaded up, we went to the party where we took the the we took the basically the sports vans off campus to another campus college. But anyways, besides that, we went over and we're we're got this golf cart. We're off property now. We're going to the shopping center. And he goes, Hey, park the cart over here. So nobody hits it. I go, okay. I said, why are you making me drive Bobby? Cause you're afraid to drive this. He says, yeah. He says, we get in trouble. You're going to take all the fall for this. I go, thanks, Bobby. I appreciate that. <laughs> he goes, you're, he goes, you're the guy that you're the guy that's getting paid to watch spr- automatic sprinklers. He says, who do you think you're going to fire me or you? You know, I go, good point. <laughs> and, and he goes, so, so we, we proceed to go and we start washing these windows And Bobby's like a master window washer, right? And he's washing these windows. And he's got this little book. I don't know if you guys ever seen those things. Like back in the day, there was this little NCR, you know, it had the carbon, the carbon paper in it. You fold it over. And it was just a little bitty receipt book. Like just look like just about the size of an iPhone. Really. That's all it was. And he's walking inside and he's signing it. He's got the cash in his pocket. He comes out, man. I'm thinking this is a great gig here. I mean, I said, I'm, all I'm thinking about it now is what's my cut of this, right? You know, how much am I going to make here? You know, because all I'm doing is wet these windows down and we're speeding along. And he goes, Hey, he goes, he goes, skip the, uh, he goes, skip the um, uh, gift card store. I said, okay, Bobby, let's, let's skip the gift card store. We've moved on to the next store. We're going on down. This is about a, so if everybody knows what 200 feet is, 200 feet's 200 feet's quite a quite a ways, right? I mean, if it's it's a pretty good distance. We're about 175 feet. We're almost to the end of the shopping center. The gift store was like a quarter of the way through the other end. So we're like I said, we're about 150 50 feet away from it. And this woman comes out of the gift store center and she's going, "Hey!" You know, she's screaming, you know, down the storefront. And the next thing I know, I'm like, I'm, I'm in Amherst. So I'm looking at this woman screaming at us. And the next thing I know, I turn around and there's a squeegee laying on the ground with a pole. Bobby's gone. Okay. I can't find Bobby. Okay. So the lady comes, she's coming down at the end of the, starts screaming down. Hey, 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 you guys skip my store. What's going on? I go, I'm sorry, man. We'll, you know, we'll get you. She says, yeah. And I want you guys to make sure you come every two weeks. I want to see you every two weeks. Don't miss my store again and come every two weeks, not once a month. I want you every two weeks. Okay, ma'am. We'll get it. I'll get it taken care of. And, uh, so these windows are wet on this, uh, shoe repair guy's store. And he, this guy knew I was struggling, but I, the windows are already wet. So I'm like, I'm not going to leave this guy with his windows all jacked up. So I, I, I begin to squeegee my first window and I get the pole up there. You know how that goes when you do the first window, right? You can't get the, you can't <laughs> stop it from having streaks, man. You know what I mean? Yeah, and so, ter- it looks terrible. Oh, it's terrible. You know, so I, yeah. I finally get it done to where I'm like, I, okay, I can leave this. I apologize to the guy. I said, hey, we'll be back. We'll get it taken care of. He was a nice oriental guy. He was a shoe repair guy. Nice guy. He's like, hey, don't worry about it. You know, blah, blah, blah. You know, we'll catch you. I go, no charge, sir. Free window cleaning today. No, you know, have a great day. I pick up the stuff, get in the golf cart, right over back over the to the uh, dispatch center where Bobby's at. And I go, what the heck's going on, Bobby? He goes, what happened, man? What happened? What happened? He goes, he goes, did you call the police? Did you call the cops? I said, call the cops. I said, Bobby, she wants two weeks services, a two month or service, two, two times a month instead of freaking one month, one time a month. I go, what's going on, Bobby? He goes, you didn't know? I said, no, what? We were washing some windows. No, man, we were hustling. <laughs> I, go, he goes, I go, what are you talking about hustling? He goes, none of those people were supposed to pay us to clean the windows. We're not the regular window cleaning guy. <laughs> I go, are you kidding me, Bobby? He goes, yeah, he goes, and that lady told me she'd see me on that property. She'd have me arrested for trespassing. I said, I said, well, thanks for telling me this stuff now, Bobby. I said, but now she wants us to wash her windows twice a month. So what are you going to do about it? He goes, I ain't going over there to wash your windows twice a month. I said, well, how much does she pay? It's 30 bucks. I said, well, I'll go over there and wash your windows then for 30 bucks twice a month and make 60 bucks. And so. So the long story short is all started off with this dude, Bobby Latino, New York guy hustling. And he, he basically showed me that these people would pay really good money. My cut that day for two hours was 260 bucks. 
for two hours worth of work. And I'm a kid. So what do you think <laughs> when you lay $260 in my pocket? Yeah, I think, how can I do that again? I went, I went to the nearest place. I, it was a janitorial place. And I spent 35 bucks. I bought a mop, a pole. I bought a wooden pole, a mop, and a squeegee. And the guy that set me up there told me, you want to buy Auditory products? He goes, they're the best. Ed Array's what most people call them, but they're really called a Tory. But the, the, bottom, the bottom line was is I was in business for about 35 bucks. I went back over to the shoe store, figured out how to wash the windows, charged the guy, went back, did the other guy. I learned something through this whole process that when I was developing building routes, um, you could give away free window cleaning to somebody that really, the window cleaning was really bad. You'd give them a free wash. They would feel obligated to eventually use your service, okay? So I would give people next to my regular customers free window cleaning on occasion. And probably 80% of them became customers. So the acquisition cost was what? What does it cost? What does it cost you to wash a, a couple store front uh, windows? Three I minutes? Mean, uh, yeah, a few minutes. You're there. A, nick, three, a nickel in product. Three, yeah. three minutes, man. And it, it became one of my biggest. It became one of my biggest tools in my arsenal, giving people free service. And I tell people this all the time. There's, I've got about five, five strategies. But by far, giving somebody a service that's going to be in a repetitive situation where they need a service all the time, over and over again, is really the best way to grow your business. I think a lot of people. I think a lot of people miss that because they don't understand that it builds an obligation. It starts a relationship that you didn't have because you gave them something and they do, it, it, it just builds an obligation. And yeah, there are some, there are some knuckleheads out there that, you know, will come on. Are you going to give me my free window cleaning in it? Oh, uh, no, <laughs> you know, we already did that. <laughs> you saw how good it was. It's time now to pay for window cleaning, you know, but, but, you know, there's just always, there's, there's good people. And there's bad people everywhere. And there's more good people than there's bad people. So, the bottom line is that's a real good, uh, real good thing. That it's funny that shoe repair guy, that the, the, the uh, Asian guy, that guy got me more customers than anybody ever got me. I couldn't believe how many people this guy knew. And he, if you don't, if he, and bit, you know, contractors don't really think about this, but a shoe repair guy, who's coming in to get their shoes repaired at a shoe store? Who is it? Business is people. It the guy, it, but is it the guy that's got the nineteen dollars shoes? No, this is a guy that's got the five hundred dollars shoes. That's yeah. right. <laughs> this guy knows everybody, and yeah. nobody thinks about that. One of my other biggest leads was a guy that did fountain restoration, and he called me a dummy the first time I met him. I was sitting in a a, a Boma meeting at a lunch, and I said, "Bert, I said, what's going on here, man?" I said. There are none of our customers at these meetings. I said, I joined this organization. It cost me a thousand bucks. And he goes, he goes, are you, are you an idiot? I go, what are you talking about? He says, look around. He says, all these other guys in here are service contractors. He says, start shaking hands and kissing babies. They know all the people you want to meet. And if they like you, they'll introduce you to them. And that, that resonated with me. And it was funny because he was a fountain contractor. Okay, who has a fountain? Broke people? Yeah, not, yeah, not me. <laughs> no broke people have fountains. No, so here, here we go again. Yeah. I got a shoe repair guy repairing Gucci handbags and Italian shoes, like you said, worth five hundred bucks. Knows every rich person in the world, and now a fountain guy that knows the other, probably knows the same people that have the Gucci handbags and the you know Italian shoes, and then it started me on my path to, okay. Who do I want to who who do I want to have as friends? You know what I mean? Who are the people that I want to associate in business with? Do I want to associate with the guys that are at the bar at five o'clock every day, you know, drinking their paycheck away? Or do I want to associate with these other type of people that are thinking about growing their business and doing the right things in business and going to networking events and getting to know other people and shaking hands and basically kissing babies? And I learned that like very early on because I was never geared to have a job. This is, this is my story right here. And I'll explain this to you. Okay. So I'm in third, I'm in third grade. And as you know, in third grade, what you have that day where you go around the room and the teacher says, what are you going to be when you grow up, Ryan? 
What was your What was your answer? What was it? Let me hear it. Oh gosh, uh, I probably would have said a baseball player or something. Yeah. A baseball player, Brad. I probably told people I was going to be an architect because that's what everybody told me. <laughs> they told you to be an architect, right? So, so here we go. That those are the type of things. Well, I got to go to the principal's office because I said I was going to own my own business one day. Jimmy said he was going to be a firefighter. Johnny said he was going to be a police officer. Jack said he was going to be a truck driver. I said I was going to be, I was going to own my own business. And the teacher told me that I couldn't say that. Now, could you imagine how furious my mother was being called down to the principal's office? They never had yeah. a job. Yeah. They never had a, no, they never had a job either. My uh, grandfather, oh. came, my grandfather came here. You understand in 1912, opened his own business. My father had his own business. My mother had multiple businesses. They never had a job. And that's my story. So the, Except so for how watching the... automatic sprinklers. You never had yeah. a job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, what, I really want to just like say this because if anyone misses what you said about the shoe guy and the fountain guy, they're missing a huge nugget. Making Massive. strategic relationships with people who know your customers is one of the most powerful strategies you can have to grow your business. Period. You want to know the you want to know the third biggest leader generator I have? What's that? Barber. He spends time with all your customers. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Cuts all their hair. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And yep. he knows all their business because they tell him. And they ask him, hey, Jimmy, you know who does this? Oh, yeah, I cut his hair. Is that, uh, I'll get his number for you, and I'll send it. I'll send him. I'll, I'll give him, have him give you a call. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. You just... I don't think people I don't think people realize how important that is to network. But but Brad, here's the other here, here's the one thing that's missing on this. When people send you referrals and things like that, then they and they and they and they go ahead and give you referrals. So many people so often think, well, you know, guys call me up and go, what should I do for that guy? He sent me a job. I said, well, how much was the job? And they go, it was twenty five thousand dollars. Send them a $500 gift card. They go, $500 gift card? I go, how many more $25,000 jobs do you want the guy to send you? I go, I go, you're giving the guy a fraction of what you made on that job. Yeah. I go, was it profitable? Oh, yeah, I made 8000 bucks. Send him 500 bucks. And I think that guys don't understand. They don't want to thank you. Nobody wants it. Oh, thank you is nice. But that's not that's not the game. If they send you a referral, take care of them. That's how another referral will come. And now you've got an army of salespeople out there that aren't on payroll. They're on commission. You know, and I think people forget that. I think I don't think they realize that and they don't understand that they got to take care of those people. Yeah, I mean that's that is just such stellar advice, but it's so funny. I mean, I can just I can just see the reactions. Five hundred dollars. Yeah, that is that is so good. So early on, I mean, you had a lot of business that you grew up with, so you had a, a head for it because you're gonna, you heard you're it. Gonna, you're gonna and you're gonna ask me, my mother and father, number one and two mentors. Uh, no, Number it wasn't. Okay. Well, I thought, well, I thought you were going. I, I gathered because, that. I was establishing that that was kind of what you shared. Yeah. yeah. But was there was there groups? Was there associations? Did you get plugged in early on? I mean, was that stuff readily available when you got started? Or you want to know what, later? man? It, here we go again. This sounds crazy. I was, you know, I'm in, I was born in the mid 1900s, right? So, so. You have to understand, like these organizations and networking things, they were created when I was the the Women's Association for pressure for uh, um, for um, property managers. 
I was here. It was it was actually created here in Phoenix. Now it's an international association. It was it was established here, and I actually donated money to help them start it, like in the in the late late '80s. And it's a strong organization now. But I was at the head of that stuff. BOMO was just being birthed at the time, a building owners and, Ma- owners and managers association, which is a huge international association. Huge. I mean, it's ginormous. It's now an international thing. The women's is still just a national association, but, but BOMO is an international. And all that stuff was created and invented um, over, the, over the time period that I've, I've been in business. So, yeah, was I plugged in early? Was I active with it? Absolutely, man, because I knew, I knew all those things were important because I saw – I saw my own mentors with my parents. They were constantly going to these events, constantly going out to uh, their events. My, my father was a lion. He always went to those events because why you met people there and you did business with it. Yeah. Did they do charity events? Did they do, you know, pancake breakfasts and raise money for charity? I saw all that happen and how big that was and how much that influenced even their own business. Mm -hmm. Um, And I knew that, you know, we could, we could, we could do a whole segment on, how being interactive in your community and donating your time to your community, not, not the United way, not donating money to the United way. That's not going to do you any good, but getting down in the trenches and feeding the homeless people, getting down there and taking blankets downtown, t- uh, being active for uh, kid and women organizations that are helping women and, and children out there. It's a huge thing. And customers, what I always try to tell people is, Find out what your customers are involved in and try to support them and get behind what they're doing if it's something you think, not fake it, but something you think you could potentially do in your life. Like for the last 15 years, um, I got this organization. It's a great organization. This woman literally helps homeless teenage girls, okay? And every year, I donate money to her all year long, but every year we have a big thing for uh, Christmas And we take them out for a Christmas dinner and we get them a gift card as big as we can get them because these girls, some of these girls are literally living under bridges. Okay. Um, And it's terrible. It's terrible that our system has failed them. Everybody always goes, well, Ron, is our goal to get these girls, you know, off from the bridges? Of course it is, but it's not to get them into the system because most of these teenage girls, the system, I can tell you horrific stories. The system failed them dramatically you know what i mean like the system's no good for them um but over this time period now i've watched these teenage girls become women you know and they keep coming back to these things at christmas time and they donate their time and then they try to help other teen girls so this thing that started off as like nine girls now is a hundred and some between women and girls that are out here supporting us saying which is which is really the one of the most one of the coolest things i ever got involved in because you're helping these people that need help right in your community i always say what's wrong with the world right how, how come there's so many homeless people if we ourselves don't take care of this these are our neighbors we have to take care of our neighbors we can't rely on anyone else to do it You've got to do it yourself. And every person out there has to embrace that and say, hey, man, I'm going to try to do my part. So about 10 years ago, I I made a commitment to always do some kind of community event once a month. I make a once a month commitment to do a community event. Sometimes you guys have seen the videos. I take my kids. I make my kids. You know, I... I don't want to say I make my kids, but I try to tell them, I said, look, man, I, I go, I know that guy stinks, but give him a hug. You know what I mean? He, he probably has had nobody hug him, nobody shake his hand, look into his eyes. I know his hands are filthy. You know, we're going to go home. We're going to go home tonight to a bath. You're going to be able to shower with hot water and clean stuff. Remember, he's living under a bridge. You know what I mean? And we, and, and we, and we feed him. You've seen, I think you guys have seen the videos. We feed about 1,200 of them twice a year. And I've almost gotten arrested for doing that, too, just so you know. That's a shame. It's against yeah. the law to feed homeless people. Do you know how I got out of it? How? We were on video, and I haven't put the video out there yet. We were on video, and I asked the sergeant. I said, Sergeant, do you have a grandmother or a mother? He says, yes. I go, has she ever baked you a pie and given it to you? He goes, yes. I said, then you got a collar to bust right there. I said, go get your grandmother to rest her, because apparently – it's against the law for her to give you a pie. So it must be against, you're telling me it's against the law for me to feed these homeless people because I'm giving them the food. And I don't know what that guy thought, 
but he completely did a 360. They got in their car and they rode away. Maybe reason finally cranked into his head. I don't know. Or, or humanity. Yeah. So what we could, we could talk a long time about <laughs> the, the fallacy of all that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I am. And I, and I Ron, you've shared bits and pieces of this. So I I didn't know how you got started. I didn't know how that happened. So you're cleaning windows. You got a great referral network. I'm cleaning network. windows and I'm shoving and I'm shoving cards under vacancy doors. Yeah. Cuz I'm only doing storefront windows at this time. No other windows. Yeah. I tried residential and I did that one time. Even took the wife with me and that was like, "Well, we ain't doing that, man. That'll never happen." And I didn't yeah, do that till, and, till yeah. later on. Yeah, I, one house, that was it. I did it's, it's enough for me to know I'm done with that. Yeah. So I'm shoving cards underneath the doors. Yeah. And uh a company called Wessex, Barbara Darley, they're a huge, huge major conglomerate. She calls me up and says, Hey Ron, I really would appreciate if you'd stop putting cards under my vacancy doors. I'm having to pay my porter guys to remove the cards because when my leasing agents are showing them and she says, man, I don't know how big your window cleaning company is, but he, she says, you are hitting every shopping center that we have, that we own. I said at the time, it was just me, man. Yeah. <laughs> I was not big, but I was hustling. And if I didn't even have, if I didn't have business in that center, I'd shove the cards. So I would drive around till wee hours of the night. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about how this, this is, this is moving from window cleaning to pressure washing. Okay. And I'm shoving those cards. And she, I go, I, I, I go, I go, Barbara, I said, it's just me, man. I says, I, says, I just, I'm, I, I do this <clears throat> as a side gig. I'm going to college and uh, just trying to, just trying to make some money to pay my tuition. Now I wasn't trying to make any money to pay no tuition, but, <laughs> but you know, it always helps to put that in their head, you know, hardworking college kid, you know, well, yeah. she says, Oh, she says, well, by any chance, do you clean sidewalks? And I said, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea I was going to clean a sidewalk. And she's the woman that gives me the uh, Target shopping center. It took 11 days, mm -hmm. 11 days. And that's how I get into it. And then from there, um, I knew at that point that the, the way we were doing it wasn't looking right. So that's when I started investigating. I was lucky again. One of my, one of my friends I went to high school with, his name's Rick Shadone. His father had a rental company. So we were renting the pressure washer. We were renting the steam clean machine from him. And then he gave me a tip. He says, hey, go down to this other buddy of mine. He didn't even sell me the original equipment. He says, go down to this buddy of mine to r &L Rental. And it was like six miles down the street. He says he has some bigger equipment that might, might work out for you to, to do this a little bit better and more efficiently. And sure enough, it was a, it was a land of dealer. And, uh, and the bottom line was, is I, uh, I my first piece, my first skid. Just remember the skid, no vehicle, no nothing, nineteen thousand six hundred dollars, and I paid cash for it. That's probably what, I, yeah, like you said, a three gallon minute machine and cold water. It was four. It was four at two, okay. okay, with hot water. Very first machine they ever made with hot water. Mm -hmm. For it too, and that's why it was nineteen thousand bucks. That same machine nowadays is like six thousand bucks, six or seven thousand dollars. So, so what is the transition then from Ron on a skid to employee number one to growth to getting off of? Oh, this is the field. funny. Like, this, this is a funny yeah. story, man. It's a funny story. So Barbara had hooked me up. She gave me like I think she started me out with like ten shopping centers, and uh, I think it's like two o'clock in the morning, man. And I don't know if you know this, but you got a wand, okay? You didn't have any ear pots, okay? There was no ear pots back then, right? You had a, you could have a big old disc player on your side or whatever it is. Or actually, it was a cassette at that time. Cassette player mm -hmm. made with some wires and stuff like that. You know what I mean? That, that, was, that was the tops. But I got none of that, you know what I'm saying? Because I got none of that. I, I'm just out there. And all you hear is the, whew, whew, whew. And you're doing that for eight hours, right? About three hours into it, you're like, you already got your strategy of exiting <laughs> this life. You're, you're, like, you're like, okay, I did a lot of thinking tonight, man. <laughs> we yeah. gotta find, we gotta find somebody to do this. <laughs> and I immediately 
like made that transition and started training people, which I was very fortunate to get Barbara as a customer because it gave me that baseline one to buy that big piece of equipment two to get an employee. And I always tell the guys, this, this, this is the thing I rented equipment, man. And if I wanted mm-hmm. to test a piece of equipment out, I rented it before I bought it. You know what I mean? I wanted to try it. If there was a way I could rent it, I do that same thing with a car today. If I want to buy an SUV, I'm going to go out and take one on a little mini vacation and say, hey, do I really like this car? If I spend $100,000 on it, why not pay it for a little rental, four or 500 a week, and, and really see if you like something? And I always try to tell guys, I had the work before I went out and bought that $19,000 machine. I had the contract signed, the agreement. I toughed through it with the rental. You know what I mean? But then when I, like I told you guys before, when we finally got the right equipment, we took that thing from 11 days to six hours. You know what I mean? So what a mm-hmm. massive improvement that is. 11 how, days, six hours. How did you know how to price that, that first shopping center? Did you just kind of. I had no clue, man. You just I had it. no clue. Yeah. No, no clue, man. I looked at it and said, man, this thing's big. <laughs> yeah. I go, how many days is this going to take me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I had no idea we were going to get it down to hours. You know what I mean? I had no clue. Um, yeah. Uh, that was something that was something that if you want to jump ahead to that, when I, hot, you know, boy, that was a long ways away because I started doing a lot of fleet washing for the first 10 years. And then I hired my I hired my first actual I had a lot of assistants. I had a lot of key workers, but I actually am finally employed after 10 years. I employed a, an actual GM. Um, and I'll tell you a little funny story about this. I took off in 95 uh, on a summer vacation in the motorhome for 90 days with my kids. And when I got back, my GM sat me down and he says, he goes, he goes, he goes, he goes, he goes, Ronnie, he goes, I've been talking to everybody. And they go, uh, we want you just to stay out of our way. <laughs> <laughs> he, he had increased revenue, increased production, yeah. and basically just said, hey, can you go back on vacation again? I said, sure, man, I'm gone. I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. Just sign the paycheck and thank you. No, that's a true story. That's yeah. a true story. And the guy was so good. He, he, a few years later, he made me so much money. A few years later, he, uh, he had an issue where he had to take a little sabbatical and I paid him for an entire year off full salary and commissions for the entire, for an entire year. He was not even around, but that's how good that guy was and how much money he made. And, uh, he made out pretty good at the end of, at the end of the road too, but he was, he was really, he was, he's, he's basically one of my key employees. I've had, if you want to talk about key employees, I could talk about them. I had a gal that was my office manager that uh, she knew, she knew how to make systems. She knew how to technically write. She wrote everything that uh, if I were still doing it to scale that I'm doing that I used to do it, I would use, I would still use that system. It was just an, she wrote awesome, awesome uh, manuals, awesome systems. Uh, I haven't put it in AI yet because I know AI will steal it, but I'm. <laughs> how did you find, so, how did you find those people? I mean, what, did you get lucky? Did you, did you know what to look for? So when you met, you met this guy that could run your business, did he come up through the business? Had he, had he done some, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, you know, Tommy, you know, Tommy Mello uh, just wrote something about this in, uh, in John Majak's book. I, didn't, I just read it and I didn't know it was in there. And so, so Tommy and I are uh, just like you've heard from like Elon and all those other guys. So I don't imagine, I imagine this has always happened to lots of uh, entrepreneurs, but as entrepreneurs, we like to go out to eat a lot. We, we see people. And when you meet that special server bus boy, you know what I mean? Um, you, there, there was a kid one time, and he was busing, and I noticed this kid's eating the food. You understand this? Like he's eating the food. Like he's bu- ever seen this happen? Like while he's working, he's busing the tables. Oh, he's eating somebody's leaving a plate. Of, somebody's leaving a plate. Somebody's no, leaving. Leave <laughs> Some guy leaves him. This guy's over there cutting the steak up, eating it. He's busting the tables as he's going. You know, we're like, are you kidding me, man? Like this guy. But we over time period, we noticed this kid's like hustling. Every time you go in there, like this kid doesn't sit still, you know, and obviously the GM doesn't care. He's eating the food. He's probably thinking, I don't have to, you know, I don't have to put a meal out for this kid because he's probably stuffed. Right. And, uh, you know, 
you, you just you see special things like that, and then you know, okay, not the kid's hungry like physically. The kid is was a worker, man. He was a hustler. He cleaned those tables off, and even though the entire time he's eating, I would notice he clean he clean two to one, maybe three to one tables than the kid that was over there not eating. You understand? Like, like I'm sitting there, mm-hmm. like, like you see the kid that's not eating, but he's, you know, uh, it's like slow motion, you know, putting the cups in, you know, has no passion to what he's doing, nothing. Doesn't detail, you know, you're looking, the kid wipes the seats. One of the things that crack, cracks me up is when I see them take that towel and they wipe the seat and they wipe the table. This kid had a different towel. He'd have a different towel for the seats. And, you know, and he was doing all the stuff the way, he was supposed to be doing it. And when you take note on that or you see that special ser- ser- person, even if they're selling you a car or they're at a car wash or something like that, and, you know, the guy's trying to add a- extra onto the ticket, that, and, and he gets you to do it because we are not people to be sold to, right? Ryan, you're mm-hmm. a salesperson. Okay, you can't stand it when Trump, somebody tries to sell oh, you. I hate it. Sell you, right? Yeah, right? I hate it. But occasionally somebody does, right? Yeah. And then you're yeah. like, how did that happen? You know, the kid got me to uh, buy something. He upsold me. And then, you know, okay, this has got, this guy's got some special skills and mm-hmm. there you go. And that, and Tommy Miller just went over that in uh, John Majek's book and he found, he found a key employee. And here we go again. I only hire people to train. I do not want anyone in my organization. When I was, when I was running full tilt, I didn't want them to have bad habits. I wanted no mm-hmm. bad habits. I wanted to train them from ground zero and build them up and mold them the way I wanted them to be. And that's the key. That is the mm-hmm. key right there. And had I ever hired somebody from the outside that had experience? Absolutely. When I couldn't, when I didn't, when I wasn't capable because I didn't have those skills. If I didn't have those skills to train that person the way I wanted to, I brought that person as a specialty. We extracted their information. We built a system. And then we trained somebody around them to learn that and, and them to mentor them. So we had additional, additional people. You know, in the sales business, uh, people don't realize that when you only have yourself as a salesperson or one salesperson, you're missing you're missing the ideology of the competition between salespeople. And when you miss that in your entire, in your, in your entire uh, organization, you'll never have a sales team. That's going to be great. You'll never have a sales team that has, I call it the magic. There'll never be any magic. Um, You got to, you got to create that competition. Salespeople are lazy. Okay. They're typically not going to follow rules. Okay. They're going to be defiant. But if you give them goals and, and there's somebody else that's meeting those goals, they will be competitive in nature and they will sell more and they will do more. Well, that's why athletes make such good salespeople, right? Like ex-football players, ex-basketball, ex-baseball players, like they make great salespeople because they love the competition and they, and they thrive on it. Yeah. That's right. And the, and the, and the, and the pressure, mm-hmm. they love the pressure. Does this mean I'm gonna have to set things up for Ryan to compete with me? I mean, is that <laughs> <laughs> absolutely? There we go. Yeah, I, I will. I will say this though: we never had a Top Gun because that Top Gun thing never worked. Our mm-hmm. sales team was always a team, so whether somebody was a good closer that week or somebody was a good starter. They'd take turns starting and closing, and it didn't matter because they shared the commissions if they, were, if they both worked on it. And it was funny because I think there was another story about where uh, I think – I don't think it was Tommy, but it was another, another well-known entrepreneur. He talked about how many leads weren't being followed up, and all of a sudden he started offering his, his uh, reception staff, if they'll do the calls, callbacks, they could get 5% of the commission. And then all of a sudden the salespeople were like, wait a minute, man. She just closed 10 units and she's only the receptionist. You know, and I only closed, yeah. I only closed five all month. Well, you know, weren't doing your follow-ups. And then the receptionists are like, now they're fighting over who's going to do the follow-up calls because she has made an extra thousand bucks. You yeah. Know? Mm-hmm. And, and, and when you get, that's the magic I'm talking about. When you get that magic happening where people start to get hungry and they start and they want to do those things and they light up like a Christmas tree because, Hey, I just got a thousand dollar bonus check that I, I shouldn't have gotten, but I got it. 
you know, or wait, I got, I got it because I did something I was supposed to do. And then when you know, now you don't have to remind these people anymore that they have to do those things. All those, all those, I guess what it boils down to, a lot of people write systems, but they don't have any checks and balances in their systems. And if you don't have any, if you don't have any accountability on your systems, they're not systems. Yeah. So go ahead, Ron. I, I, was, I was say one of the things, and you can cut me off if this is getting too off topic, but one of the things I know just about you in general is you are a big proponent of free education. And, and I, obviously that comes from like years of training employees and, and all of that. But is that like, is that something just instinctual to you of like, Hey, I, just, I like to train it's everybody or did powerful, you have like, it's the most powerful thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah. So, yeah, but it didn't powerful. come from like, Hey, I went to this like trade show that I paid for a lot of money and it was horrible. So I'm going to write this or has it just been, Hey, this has just been part of who you've been from the beginning is you've been my one father, to seek out my education. Father, and- my father always network with all the professionals in his industry. Mm-hmm. And he, he, he taught me that, you know, a lot of the ideology and things that, that he got and the strategies he got from, uh, running his, running his own businesses were from these other entrepreneurs that he associated with. And back then there was no pay to play. They all mm-hmm. just shared amongst each other because, um, they knew that they knew that my father might know something they didn't know. And he, they knew something he didn't know. And now, uh, we're, even though they were competitors, you know, they could put Johnny out of business now or whatever, you know, because mm-hmm. they're working together, uh, trying to trying to get as much of the market as they could. And also, you know, they would also share the market because there's always things that you don't do. And that's what people when, when people think, oh, I'm scared of my competition, man, my competitors, I sub more competitors out and wound up buying more competitors uh, over the time period, because, you know, the bottom line is and here's the thing. When you go out and help and everybody goes, well, you'll help your competitors, Ron. I go, yeah, I'll help them. How many of these competitors do you think came to me and said, hey, Ron, you know, it's just not for me. I got to bag it. But I got $300,000 worth of regular work and a couple of machines. You know, I need to unload this stuff. Otherwise, my wife's going to leave me because I'm working 70 hours a week. I got to go back. I got to go back to the airport where I can work nine to five and have a steady paycheck. Mm -hmm. You know, who do they come to first? Yeah, the guy that's helping them. Yeah, they're going to come to me, you know? Yeah. So nothing is free, right? Nothing is free, right? Mm-hmm. Guys come to these events, and, and grant, there's f- great free education, but the bottom line, the people that are paying for the events are the, are the vendors and, and distributors that, yes, they expect you to support them when you come to these events. Is, is it something you have to do? No, but here we go back to that obligation again. When, a, when somebody comes to an event, and they do really well off the information that they base themselves upon on, on the event. They do reciprocate by saying, you know what, Trudy, you know what, so-and-so, that you, you, I went to your event. It was great. I need another machine. I want to give you a shot at buying that machine from me, a shot. Sometimes it's not a given, but it's a shot. Mm-hmm. That's why I don't understand why guys, uh, they get mad at, uh, like, guys for buying equipment other places. And then when they get a call – to repair a competitor's equipment, they're upset. Mm-hmm. I want to repair that competitor's equipment that didn't answer the phone. I want to show you now that here's you made a mistake. I'm going to help you fix this piece of equipment so that when you buy the next machine, you know you're never going to make that mistake again. You're going to buy it from me. But mm-hmm. these guys will hang up the phone on these guys. I'm like, that's not winning any. That's not winning anything. How are you going to feel when that guy has 25 machines? And instead of buying from the original guy you were upset about, he buys them from the next guy that answers the phone and helps them. Mm-hmm. And you could have sold them the 25 machines in the future, but yet you did that. It's kind of like, you know, burning bridges. You don't burn bridges. Yeah. You don't burn bridges. I, I, burn, I burned a bridge once. It only took me once. I burned it one time. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we talk a lot about that. Like, I mean business is built on relationships. And I, I think even still like and even more so now as we become more detached from like personal interactions and we get more into things like AI and into online zoom calls and, and things like this, like all of that, I think drives the importance of relationships even more. And I think people are still 
like starving for some of that in business is they're used to just sitting in front of the computer all day talking to chat GPT or whatever it is. And like, but then if you can be the guy who answers the phone, who calls him, who takes like the step to be there in person and shake their hand, like that is so much more valuable and so much more powerful than sending out a monthly email of here's our, whatever our discount of the month. Why don't you come to our website and buy it? You will never run with the big dogs unless you're out there shaking hands. It's, it's just not going to happen. And no, no, no website, no Google ad, no Google. Um, none of that stuff is ever going to, you, you're not ever going to run with the big dogs uh, through that. And, and, and I would, I would be safe to say that it's changing a little bit, but if you had typically gotten a Google call for any type of substantial commercial job, um, it's probably a bad customer. It's somebody that, that used up all their resources and now they're going to Google because those people that are typically important people, they don't use Google. They're going, yeah, yeah. They're, they're going, they're going for a reference. If they don't know of you, they're going to go for yeah. a reference. Yeah. The, the CEO of Walmart, it's not getting on Google to find a local pressure washer to come and <laughs> look, looking at the best if reviews. He, if to he's find, traveling, yeah. he might find a delicious restaurant, but he's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. He's not looking, he's not going, we need our five stores washed in, you know, Arkansas mm -hmm. and he's not going to the Google to find, to find a service contractor. No, absolutely mm -hmm. not. Ron, you have, you know, you've talked about it. I've, I've seen evidence of it. Being involved with the association seems like it's been a big thing for you for a long time. I know that you've played different roles, that you've, you, you've had leadership. Um, and at the same time, and, and I say this not wanting to pick at anything, but controversial with, with some of the associations, but it obviously means a lot to you. And, and I, I'd be interested to hear your thought on professional associations in this industry in particular, not like which ones you like and which ones you don't like, but the role they play and why you're so passionate and continue to get back involved, even when it seems like maybe that wouldn't be the easiest thing to do. Well, it's not the easiest thing, but because what I've seen in customer associations, my affiliation with customer, not our own trade association, not our, not our trade associations. I've seen that they're dying. They are dying for our industry to become organized, to become more professional. And people don't understand that if our industry was more professional and as was more organized and had more association training that was directly related with, you know, certification processes and, th and those things, contractors don't understand those elite customers they they wouldn't even well let's say if they can't get a referral they would go to the national association and try to find somebody they wouldn't google somebody they would go to somebody that has the credentials and and utilize them and guys don't understand i don't believe they think how important that is and they think their customers don't care cuz you hear it all the time they go yeah well they, no one's ever asked me if i'm certified well cuz you're not certified they already know you're not your competitor told them they were certified and they just didn't want to feel stupid to ask you that you're not certified because they know they're looking on your website and they know you're not. Because if you were certified, it would say it. And, uh, you know, people think that those things don't mean anything because they're a piece of paper. Who certifies who? Well, guess what, guys? The, the, the industry is who makes up the certification standards. It's not, it's not a professor at some university that doesn't know how to pressure wash. Okay. It's the industry professionals that, that create the standards. Um, professor at some university may write them, but the information has to come from us. It has to come from us. We're the guys out there. We're the guys out there in the field that need, that know this and need this. And there are, there's an elite customer out there that wants to desperately hire the absolute best people that they can hire. And normally that would be, be through someone through a strong trade association. I mean, is, is somebody with real money, you're in the building business, are they going to hire a master plumber or somebody that just picked up some tools at Home Depot and said, I'm a plumber now. I'm gonna I watched a couple of YouTube videos and, I'm, and I want to come out and 
do I want to do all the new construction. I want to, I want to do all the groundwork and lay it out. The, How would that turn out? The customers, How would that turn the out? customers you want only are going to hire licensed plumbers and electricians and contractors. The type of customer that doesn't care, you don't you don't you don't want that customer. I know. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I mean, and that and that's why that that sums it up. That's why I'm involved in the association because I don't believe in quitting, and I think that I think that one day, one day we'll have enough professional guys in the industry, even if it's only 200, it's thousands. But even if it's only 200 of the right guys that can make a stronger trade association stronger and wield that association, I think it'll be good. I think right now the PWNA is um, is closer to that than um, than they've ever been. The 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 dynamics with the PWNA. Is because uh, the only the only problem with this, and PWNA, I'm sorry, but I'm just going to give my constructive criticism, and it's not really constructive criticism. They've had a, internally they struggle between the distributors and the contractors, so they're going so, so they're sometimes trying to go different down different roads. You know what I mean? Where other organizations, trade associations that are only contractor oriented, are fixed on just the contractor, and what what needs to happen is is there needs to be a break either in the PWNA where they decide, hey, we're, we've got a middle road and we're going to both go down that road together, or another trade association has to say, hey, we're going down this road and that's the road we're going to, that, that's the path we're going to take. And that's the struggle that we've had with the oldest organization, PWNA, where you got these two paths and they always want to seem like every five years, they always want to take off on their own path. The UMCC, um, it's just, it's very difficult because contractors come and go in this industry and there's really not in a contractor oriented, like a contractor like me, we're 1% of the industry. You know, most of the contractors in this industry are one man bands or home service providers, you mm -hmm. know, and that's, and, and there's nothing wrong with uh, guys that are home service industry or even one man bands. There, there's a, there's a place for them, but those guys don't have the mentality that the organization is really going to help them. And, and maybe Susie homemaker, doesn't care about a, a certification. Maybe she doesn't. But I think that's that's the hard thing is I think a lot of contractors see like certifications as a bad thing. They're like, oh, they don't tell me how to do my job. Don't tell me I don't need the government or the city or whatever saying that I have to do this type of water reclaiming because they know what's best for whatever. And I, I think that that's certainly a hard thing to get over. And I, I think I liken it a lot to like the restoration industry. Like obviously there is a need for certification and certain things in restoration. Like when you get into mold and like there, there needs to be a proper way to do things. And, and I think like I even have a, I think they're expired now, but I've got a few um, restoration certifications from years ago um, for like structural drying. And like, for me, I, I see it as only a benefit as the more education, the more like unified we can be, the, the better it is. It better is for the industry as a whole. And uh, I think and, the hard and the thing. Mentor, and the mentorship that should exist yeah. inside of the association, right? I mean, the mentorship, the mentorship. I mean, everybody always, everybody comes to these events. We've talked about it. What's the best part of the event? Networking. Yeah, the, the networking. The networking. The right, networking. Yeah. Because mentoring is networking. I mean, that's what it really is. We all sit around, whether it's in a lounge or whether it's around having a cup of coffee. We sit around just like this setting here, and we, you know, shoot the bull with each other. And all of a sudden, something goes boom and clicks and goes. That's the problem that I was having. And Brad or Ryan have the solution. I never even thought about it because we all know sometimes those solutions have been so simple because we've looked for complicated. You know, we've looked for complicated fixes, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes somebody's got the easy, easy, easy answer. And that's where the real power is. And so when you share information, I'm a firm believer, it comes back to you tenfold. Yeah. Tenfold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tenfold. Absolutely. And I don't think, I don't think people, I don't think people believe that. They go, why would I want to tell my competitor or something like that? Because if all the standards were here, what happens? We all make more money. And then I'd rather, I would rather compete with these guys here than try to compete with this guy down here. Right. Because mm -hmm. this guy down here is, is, is really, he's low priced. He's doing shoddy work and who's paying for it. 
We all are. The consumer and the contractor that's trying to do the, to do the job right. Every time. I know we did some jobs um, for clients who had gotten ripped off by other contractors. And what I've picked up on is every time someone in your industry of your profession, no matter how shoddy they were or how fly by night they were, when they go do dishonest things, it reflects on everyone in the profession. And you have to go make that up to the next person. That didn't help us. For him to screw it up didn't help us. The person was so scared that they were going to lose another $50,000 again. Don't you hate when somebody says they got what they paid for? <sighs> they got ripped off. Yeah. yeah. They paid and got ripped off. They didn't get what they paid for. They thought they were going to get clean sidewalks, and they didn't. You know, I mean, and here's where we go again. One of my biggest strategies, when I see repeat repetitive customer, they get ripped off. You think it's going to you think it's going to be a tough one for me to say, "Hey, I'll fix that for you. Don't worry about it. No charge." Mm-hmm. By the way, when I get it fixed, I'll be in for lunch, which they're going to what? Yeah, they're, they're going to buy. Comp your lunch. Yeah. They're going to buy. They're going to buy the lunch. And we're going to further talk some more about how we can get them on a maintenance package. Bam. Mm-hmm. Hey, thanks for taking care of that. I had a real important inspection tomorrow. You saved my butt. You know, and you, and you do things like that. You make impressions on people, and then they want to do something for you. They, in return, want to reciprocate what you did for them, they want to reciprocate that. So then they start talking about all their buddies they know in the restaurant business. Because guess what? This is, a, this is another tip. Maybe, you, maybe you'll be able to put these little nuggets in. We don't realize how many other people. We know each other. We're in this industry. How many of your customers know other people in their industry? They know tons. They know mm-hmm. them all. All of our industries are a small world, aren't they? Yeah, so small. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we know we know all the people in the industry. They know all those other managers that you want to work for. They know them. All you've got to do is ask them or build that build that relationship with them, and they're going to share it with you because inherently people want to help you. They want to help you. Yeah, and I, I think what's lost is that people, contractors, don't realize that the the tuition or the cost or whatever you want to to call it for that networking is just the relationship building and if you go like let's say i go and i clean a chick-fil-a i'm gonna go sunday because they're they're closed i go and clean it i drop off the check or i drop off the bill send them an email say thanks for it whatever see you next month or see you next week whatever my whatever my thing is you you can do that forever and you can keep cleaning that same Chick-fil-A forever. But if you go and then you spend time with them and you, you do those extra things and you talk with the manager, then what's going to happen is they're going to see you as a like a, a valuable asset to their business. And when they go and have their meeting with all the other Chick-fil-A managers in the area and someone says, hey, we've, we're having issues with our drive throughs really dirty. They, the, the guy's not getting the crease out of it. Who are you using? Then naturally they're going to make the introduction. They're going to to build that network. But that won't happen without being on a in an actual relationship with the customer, not just a transactional relationship. Yep. Ron, I I'm very interested in your in your take on this. I know when we were in the home inspection industry, it was a really cool time because it really was coming of age. You know, the professionalism, the business, the education, the licensing, all of it was coming of age. And I know that from the things that you've shared and other people have shared, I, I know I talked to another guy that you know, 40, 50 years ago, there's a lot of ex-convicts in the pressure washing world. And it's come a long way from is, that. isn't there? <laughs> I think it's I come a long know. way, right? And there's a lot more businesses. Okay. There's a lot more. Yeah. There's, there's, legit. There's a lot more legit. A lot more legit people. What is it going to take to go from where we are today mm to this vision that you talk about where it really is a reputable professional industry that rivals some of the others that, that the people know some of the other trades. I don't believe it's as far off as we think. I think, I think that, uh, I think it's going to happen. Um, there's always new people coming in with the passion and I always say this, we need younger people 
to really embrace this and and get and get on board with it. Um, it's not going to happen with the old guard. You know, we we see we see the uh, we see it in in lots of trade industries. The, the older companies, distributors, manufacturers, they just don't want to change their ways. They're happy with the status quo, and uh, it's going to take it's going to take a younger crowd with new technology. And uh, I believe it's going to happen. I believe it's going to happen. I think I think we're I think we're about three I think we're about three years out from seeing uh, one of these trade associations just blow up and run with it. And it could be the PWNA, it could be the IWCA. Um, I've always said this, and IWCA never gets any sound bites on this, but as far as the customer connection, the customer to the contractor, I'm talking about like contractor customer. That's where trade associations have to focus, right? They have to focus on being understood that this is the elite contractors and this is where customers look for them. But no one really builds that bridge. I think the IWCA has because they've gone and done some OSHA things that the OSHA bridge brings the customers to it because they're there going, oh, here's the OSHA standards for window cleaning. And that was a big thing for the window cleaning industry. Ryan knows what I'm talking about. It's a big thing for the in- in- window cleaning industry because a lot of those customers, they can't use anybody but a somebody that's going to be you know, um, OSHA trained mm. or, or they got a big liability on their hands. And we're typically talking the high rise, right? Yeah. So now we're talking big money, big money customers, right? They, and they've done the job and they've gone to associations like BOMA and the shopping center associations and they've told them and they've made an awareness of this. And uh, that in itself is a huge thing because we, we, when we talk about things like, you know, monopolizing on they're expanding, they're just going to keep compounding on top of each other and it becomes more and more and bigger and bigger. And then all of a sudden the old guard guy, you know, here he is. Hey, where's your OSA certification from the IWCA? I don't have it. Oh, I'm sorry, Jimmy. Uh, we're going to have to go with uh, Billy over here. I know he's only 22 years old, but, you know, he's went through and got all the training. And, you know, liability-wise, this is who we got to hire because they have, all the, they have all the information and knowledge. Uh, well, what do you mean, man? I've been, I've been, I've been doing this for 22 years. Uh, sorry, man. You know, we just can't. Our insurance company, because guys don't understand this. The insurance companies want to see that stamp, you know that? And most guys get on me like this because they go, Ron, you talk about regulations, deregulating things. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm talking about government regulation. I'm not talking about regulations and standards that are in the industry. I'm all for that. I want them to be the highest we could possibly make them. I just don't want to get overreached by the government on regulations, okay, where it gets so stupid because we all know, we all know this. Things can get out of hand. And, and wait a minute, that's why we even more so need the trade associations because did you guys know that in uh, Mecklenburg, North Carolina, back in 2008 or no, 2009, they tried to reclamate house washing? Hmm. If we hadn't had a strong trade association, your houses in North Carolina would be much dirtier there, Brad. I didn't because know that. No I, one, grew, I, grew, I grew up in Mecklenburg County. No so one, no one would have no one would have wanted to wash their house. Could you mm-hmm. imagine? You would have to capture all the water from washing your house. Most absurd, ridiculous thing you ever heard, huh? Mm-hmm. I can't even imagine yeah, well, how if, that would work out. Yeah. <laughs> if we did if we didn't have a trade association to at least reason with them, because you can't go talk to them. I can't go talk to them. Ryan, you can't go talk to them. Mm-hmm. It has to be a national non-for-profit organization. It has to be the leaders of that organization. They can't even discuss it with you as a private person. Does, does anybody know that? I don't think it's appreciated. It's probably not even well known, but it's certainly not appreciated. Walmart cannot use a private certification, a private company. We're not going to name any names. There's lots of them in this industry. They ha- they can only recognize a uh, basically a tax exempt corporation that's nonprofit, and there's a reason for that. So, so I, my question for that then is how do how does that 
happen because obviously it, it's it gets to be tricky, right? If a, if a vendor ends up trying to enforce whatever BMPs and, and all that, then then they get looked down on because then they're seen as, hey, I'm I'm trying to sell increase regulate, yeah, I'm increase regulation to sell. Regulation Reclaim equipment, correct. Or that's, so, and that's. And are you ready for this one? Every time we get one of these cockamamie stories where there's a moratorium on pressure washing or something like that in these towns, happened in Gwinnett County, Georgia. Moratorium mm-hmm. on pressure washing because somebody blew the whistle on somebody saying, "Hey, he can't be washing that water down the drain." And all of a sudden, instead of the city going and doing what they're supposed to do, or the county, they go cease and desist all pressure washing now. Mm-hmm. How would you like that to happen if you've been in business for twenty years? Yeah, yeah. And again, the trade association went in and straightened them out. And we didn't have moratorium very long. Lasted a whole year in Florida. A whole mm-hmm. year they were under moratorium. You know? but, but the reality of it is, is you, we have to do the education. We have to have guys understand this. But more, more so than anything, we need to build the bridges between customers, municipalities, with the trade association. We need to invite these municipalities to the events. We need to have them come and see the latest technology and understand we're writing processes and certifications to protect the environment, to be better have safe procedures and processes. These are the people that need to be coming to our trade shows, our customers, mm-hmm. not, not contractors. Contractors can come, but we want customers to come and see so that they can write requests for proposals with the stamp on them. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes more powerful because now if if the city of Atlanta all of a sudden starts saying, we want a rubber stamp of some certification from a national trade association on there, the prices go up, Mm -hmm. the level goes up, and everybody's a winner. The environment, the employees of the contractor, because they're going to be safer because they're going to have to practice according to the standards that they wrote. Mm-hmm. And, and Brad knows a little bit about this, about contract. They have to comply, right? If they write an agreement, they have to comply with it. So many of these guys out there right now see in a master service agreement. And a master service agreement is different than a contract, okay? A master service agreement is, is a completely different item. A lot of these corporations work on master service agreements. And they'll put in there that you're supposed to reclaim the water. But they're only diverting the liability from themselves onto your shoulders. Yeah. Do they care if you do it? Obviously not, because we know we don't have to mention these master service agreements that say that. We can, we can go on any given night of the week, videotape some contractor. Master service agreement said they're supposed to be reclaiming it. They don't even have a reclaim unit anywhere near the... It, it, it's, it's at their shop sitting in a corner collecting dust. Okay? Mm-hmm. And, and that's... Now... now there's guys out there, and I want to make this statement because if this makes the, this makes the final cut, it makes it. But I don't promote any contractor to ever rat on another contractor. Don't do that. It's the wrong thing to do. It really is. It's the wrong thing. It'll never result in anything positive for you. Never. That's not how you raise the standards, right? No. No, go tell this guy if he doesn't know. Go show him, you know, if he doesn't know. And if he tells you, oh, yeah, my reclaim unit's back there collecting dust at the shop and I'm not using it, okay, no big deal. Yeah. yeah Fantastic. I'll buy, it from you. I'll buy it from you for 100 bucks. How about that? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll take it off your hands, right? Yeah. You know, whatever. You know, but, you know but, you don't, but you don't go ratting people out. That's just not, it's not a good thing. It's just not a good thing. It'll never, it'll never result in anything positive. Bad-mouthing your competition never is going to result in anything positive. Amen. Never. And, and, mm-hmm. and, and customers will fish, so be careful. Don't fall for the bait. Mm-hmm. That is yeah, some I think solid advice. It. Yeah, I, I, th- I think in general that's good advice. Yeah, and, and whether it's for, and it, like, I've I've always been a fan of when I, when I was cleaning when I was cleaning houses I had a list of probably five or six people in my phone who if if they were a roofing contractor if they were a cleaner in another zip code. I, I had them in my phone, and so if someone said, like, "Hey, I've got a house in whatever 20, thirty miles, we're outside of my range of where I was working. Hey, who should I go see?" I'd pull up their phone number, I'd give it to them around the spots, like, "Hey, use this guy." Like, I don't. Obviously, they're not my customer. If I'm, I'm not going to be driving an hour out of my way for for one residential house. Um, but if I've got people in my network who I can connect them with, or I say, "Hey, I noticed that you're." 
downspouts are, I got your downspouts all clean, but I notice it is clogged up underground. Um, that's not something I can do, but here is the phone number of a guy who, um, does that for you can clean out your fringe drains. You better get and, a jetting. You better get a jetting attachment. That's a hundred and twenty five dollar yeah. jet that you could just hooked up to your pressure washer, man. Clean that thing out like that, Ryan. Come on. You, Come you on. You could have, or but the the route I went was mm-hmm. instead, hey, here's the number of the guy who'll do it. I've already sent him a picture and told him about it. He's expecting a phone call from you. Then like done. Let let that be what it is. Let that relationship happen and then it, it goes both ways and then they help build up my business in the same way for for competitors too is i hate the i hate when guys say like well if i if i'm training my competitor or if i'm helping them out they're going to steal my customers it's like okay well one if number one like if you don't have like a signed contract they're not your customer like if someone just like if someone underbids you or someone does that like they didn't steal your customer they just if they anybody the takes then... a customer from you this is as simple as it is i'm, I'm gonna simplify this for you even more mm-hmm. if anyone takes your customer they were never your customer yeah but it's a little I deeper agree. than that isn't it yeah because it's about that relationship that you have because mm-hmm. even if you are not doing your job even if you get caught with your pants down if you have a relationship with somebody and one of those people come along and try to take that person from you, that person is going to call you and always give you the benefit of the doubt to either fix the problem and that's what's going to happen. And if you, yeah. then if you, and then if you screw up, well, then that's your own fault because then you lost that customer. You mm-hmm. lost the customer. The, no one took was, it from you. You lost them. Yeah. I, I would say the, what I found especially true for my time in the industry was my best customers were always the ones that I screwed up big on the first shot time I was out there. Like, I, is this I a strategy them. now? You <laughs> yeah, exactly. screw up on go, the first job. Yeah, go break a window. Um, <laughs> no, but but like he's gonna bring the, his kids with him next time. Throw to throw a baseball through the window. I so, were playing out catch and busted your window. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll get back to what I was saying. One of the funny things, my in laws and I, t- I still clean my in laws' windows. Um, but one of the things we always joke about is I've got a racket going because we bring our kids over, they smear their hands over their windows and then they have to pay me to go clean them. <laughs> um, but no, we, what I found was always the best customers were the ones where I broke something, something went wrong. And then the customer sees like, saw me take ownership over it and fix it. And typically I would fix it before I even report it to him. It's like, Here, Hey, I broke it al- this window. It always comes back to this. Mm-hmm. trust. Yeah. All of a sudden your trust meter went up here. Mm-hmm. You know, they could have said, Hey, that could have guy could have just left. We wouldn't have noticed that window cracked, but he didn't. He, he fessed up to it. He took care of it. This is a guy we want on our property. <laughs> so I'll, I'll give one very specific example and then I can stop talking about this, but I had a customer where they had a, one of those flag, like a flagpole in the front of the house, an American flag. And you know, like the little adjustable, uh, connector thing that connects to the house. Um, I was there, I think I was pressure washing. I pulled my hose over by it and broke the thing right off the house. And so I was like, Oh, great. So I got to deal with this. So what I ended up doing was I was like, I stopped working. I went to home Depot, found the exact same one, got it reinstalled, got them a new like pull and everything. And then before I, they weren't home at the time. And then what happened is when I call them to give them the end of the report, I said, Hey, this is what happened. I broke this in accident. I've already fixed it for you. If there's any issues you have going on, let me know and I'll, I'll get a better fix for you. And that is a cut. Like that was a customer for life. Like, Hey, I broke something of theirs, but before I even approached him with the problem, I had a solution. You're talking about one of my strategies. I fixed stuff that I didn't even break. Yeah. How do you like that? How do you like that one? Yeah. Let's take a picture of it, fix it, take another picture of it and say, I fixed that. And then they go, how much are you going to charge me for that? Don't worry about it. We, we took care of it. You're yeah. good. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I think that is one of the best they, ways. They to love, get they love life, that stuff. They love that yeah. stuff. They love this. Stuff. So many stinking strategies. Let's do a video on all these strategies one day, Brad. Let's okay. do that. Let's do a video. It'll be a gold. It'll be a golden video. I, I think just of all the, they are, they are so underappreciated and so effective and that you're, I, I, you know, as somebody who spends a lot of time talking with people about marketing, I can tell you, you'd be better off to spend time on these strategies that revolve around trust and relationships 
uh, than you would trying to crack the next code on your Facebook ads. You know, it, absolutely. The, for the sure. ROI on this will be much, much greater. You know, there's either, either you, you have, you have really two options if you want to grow your business, right? You can either get your customers to keep buying from you forever, or you can get your customers to get you more customers. And uh, there's never a more powerful strategy than getting customers to get you more customers. Your best, your best thing ever is your customer's testimonial or your customer's referrals. It's, it's automatic. It jumps the trust meter to an eight. If they refer you to somebody or give you somebody's name, it goes to an eight. Yeah. Period. You know, and that's a scale of one to 10 guys. And you want people, you want people to buy. You don't even want them to buy from you until you're an eight. It changes the transaction. It changes the transaction. It is. You mean go out there and take care of that for me and bill me? Yeah. You like that one? Yeah. Makes guys all the time go, well, wait a minute. You're going to go ahead and go ahead and do that work before they even quote. Uh, you give them a quote. Yeah, because they need it today and they trust me and I trust them and we're going to go ahead and get them taken care of. You know, those are the customers you want. So are we done, guys? Yeah. Oh, you got to do yes. a conclusion. Yeah, I, no, I, I, go I think that was good. I, I, yeah. I, I think I think that was awesome, man. Thank you, Ron. I I appreciate your passion and your advocacy for your industry. And I know it extends well beyond anything that that pays you back monetarily. And I appreciate that. And I, I appreciate your time today. Yeah. All right, guys. That's it.